do you see an increase in foreign direct investments in South Africa in general and from American companies? So that's an interesting question because it's a South Africa being a small open economy means that we pretty much in terms of trade and FDI in particular at, at the mercy of uh, movements and shifts in the global economy. So as you well know, that's really a, a global answer in the sense that um, because of uh, low growth in the U.S. economy, one is likely to see far less FDI uh, streaming into South Africa than you would ordinarily. Um, and uh, sort of overlaying that outside of the U.S., given the problems in the Eurozone, uh, the likelihood of high FDI uh, is even lower within the South African context. I mean, there is, the, there is a micro issue, uh, so a domestically driven issue, which is around at the margin, given policy uncertainty issues in South Africa, that may further constrain any opportunities for FDI by American companies. Yeah, that brings me to the question, how do you explain the South African rigidities that constrain the foreign direct investment? For example, there's uncertainty about government economic policy. The ANC is planning to have a meeting at, in the, at the end of this year, and they are trying to push for greater government intervention. So do you see more government intervention in economic policy or less intervention? So the backdrop for that debate is that uh, there was a push, uh, given last year's policy conference, uh, ANC policy conference, there was a push for nationalization to be put on the policy agenda, as opposed to uh, a statement of nationalization. The ANC released, uh, had its economic policy conference about a week ago, and they've, uh, that economic policy conference, in the lead up to the December conference, has clearly stated that nationalization is not on the agenda. So in fact, that's a f one of the first sort of very clear statements from the ANC that they're not considering any wholesale nationalization of, of mines. Um, the, again, the more subtle point is that if we get to December, which is the policy conference uh, the, where the final decisions are made, one may see um, some uh, stronger statements around uh, state involvement in the economy, but more in the form of perhaps super taxes, such as you have in the Australian case uh, with the mining industry. And in, in a sense, this debate about nationalization is really a debate about uh, more states say in the running of mines. So it's really about the mining industry rather than nationalization. So my sense is that we've moved away from the nationalization debate uh, in the lead up to December and there's been more nuanced discussions about state uh, involvement in the mining industry uh, through super taxes or perhaps a state mining company and so on, which is not unusual in the developing country context. So the South Africa is really a, a, a country that is ranked very highly. However, there are poor marks too. For example, there are rigidities in the labor market, there's shortage of skills, and uh, recently there's a lot of perception of rising corruption in South Africa. And there's a lot of youth unemployment. So what are the policies that um, South Africa is undertaking to do away with all these rigidities or to make sure that they are not a hindrance to the growth of the South African economy. So I think that's right. I mean, you've got, a, you've got, a, you've got wonderfully efficient uh, markets in terms of financial regulation, in terms of banking regulation, uh, on the fiscal policy side, uh, as you say, on corporate governance. South Africa has done very, very well. Um, and the, and, the, and all, all sort of published indices uh, corroborate that. The, 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 the challenge really lies at the micro level uh, in terms of, if you like, the supply side of labor, looking at the schooling system, looking at skill shortages. Uh, and in fact, the indices that one sees uh, in, in that respect rank South Africa very lowly. So if you look at um, the, the TIMS index, which looks at maths and science scores, South Africa is very low, um, below comparator economies and below some low-income countries. So I think in that context, it's very, very true that we've performed very poorly. The question is, what are the, what are the, uh, what are the policies that are in place? There, I think government is slowly moving to, trying to move to a point where more specific micro-focused interventions are being examined. Uh, for example, if one looks at schooling, there's the issue of teacher training and teacher productivity, uh, textbook provision, 
um, ensuring that absenteeism at schools are really low. Again, as a as a sort of uh, uh, to ensure that the schooling system functions effectively, so that you have an adequate supply of skilled labour. Um, is that happening um, uh, effectively enough within the South African context? I don't think so. I think there's uh, there's a fair amount of thinking going on. Their framework documents, their goals. Uh, but ultimately, in terms of the results we're seeing, it's not clear that those, uh, for example, around teacher training, quality of teachers, teacher productivity, textbook provision, those are not necessarily working as effectively as they can be. Um, in, the, in the context of skills, workplace skills training programs are existent, but they're too efficient, inefficient at the moment. Uh, government is trying to reorganize that, but again, we... We seem to be just a bit too long on frameworks and too short on um, on sort of uh, practical implementation at the local level, and and that's true for skills, that's true for um, uh, for schooling, uh, and one worries that in the long run this youth unemployment bulge will just remain, uh, and unless we get to the local level and implement these various policies, which are not unusual again for a developing country context, I think we're going to struggle. Um, to reduce uh, youth unemployment significantly. How about the rising perception of corruption that is rising in South Africa? Yes, so that's an interesting one because I think, you know, you never know uh, if it's an endogenous result. In other words, you never know if, if what you're observing is greater reporting of corruption rather than the greater incidence of corruption. Um, I suspect it's a bit of both. Um, there is a view that under the current uh, regime you're seeing an increase in corruption. I'm not sure. I haven't seen any numbers to indicate that corruption has gone up. I think it's at a high enough level to be worrying. But has it increased dramatically? I, I don't think so. Um, um, I think the, the issue really is that, there's, um, that w what has happened is that uh, state tenders are far too easily available to, if you like, well-networked, um, wealthy individuals rather than marginalized uh, communities like the informal sector. Um, and that's, uh, uh, that's an argument to make, if you like, for um, a developmental argument against corruption. A lot of companies in Africa have their headquarters in Johannesburg or Pretoria. And uh, recently, South Africa has been invited to join the BRICS. But um, other countries in Africa think they should be the gateway to Africa. For example, Nigeria, which has a a record of good growth rates, which is actually double the growth rate of South Africa. It has a population of 158 million. How do you respond to such um, um, allegations of uh, South Africa as a representative of Africa, while there are other economies in Africa doing better than South Africa? No, should I think be a those are, yeah, those are very fair argument, arguments. I mean, I think uh, the Nigerian case is a particularly strong one. Um, growth rates are much higher. It's a much larger economy. It's the most populous uh, nation on the continent. So in that sense, those arguments are really strong. I mean, I think to some extent, those choices are made by companies, um, including the multilateral institutions, where they choose South Africa as their base. Um, ironically, South Africa hasn't really tried hard enough, I don't think, as a nation, as, as a corporate South Africa, to, to find or to make inroads into Africa. Um, uh, I think currently you are seeing la the large corporates within the South African context in terms of telecommunications. So beyond mining, telecommunications and retail, you are seeing South African corporates moving into uh, north of the Limpopo River, so to speak. Um, the question of whether it should be Nigeria versus South Africa, I think that's the wrong way to think about it. I mean, to some extent, we've, we've looked so much at BRICS and South Africa's membership thereof and the G20 and what about Nigeria versus South Africa and perhaps we need to be thinking about a Nigeria and South Africa on the continent. A Nigeria, South Africa, Mauritius, Botswana, sort of fast growing middle income countries or almost middle income countries within the African continent to, to form some, some sort of alliance um, uh, to think about economic development on the continent. Now to the question that most people are interested is um, the South African engagement with the Chinese. Is the South African engaged with the Chinese? Are they um, dominating in terms of other investors are being kicked out, the Americans and Europeans? What do you see in South African case? And who is South African trading partner? Are yeah. they moving 
So South Africa, again, you know, we, I think we look very similar to most other economies with respect to China. Um, we're, the, we're an importer of uh, sort of uh, low value added uh, Chinese commodities, and principally clothing and um, uh, other manufacture, light manufactured goods, uh, and we export minerals. And that's a, in, in the South African developmental context, that's unhealthy, right? So what we'd like to see is greater opportunities in China at the, in terms of high value added commodities that South Africa is participating in. I don't think we're participating enough in, the, in that kind of trade. Um, so if you look at processed manufacturing, um, food products and so on, South African firms, which are fairly dominant on the continent and in some, in some product lines, even in the developed world, haven't really found a foothold in China. Um, what has happened where we have gained in, in the South African context is on the financial and business services side. So often Chinese uh, firms, um, state-owned companies use uh, South Africa's financial and business services, um, uh, if you like, competitive advantage on the continent to uh, arrange and access deals, financial deals on the continent. And in that sense, uh, there's been um, a return for the South African economy. Uh, whether we've uh, sort of balanced the books adequately in terms of a trade balance sense uh, and a develop economic development sense, I think like most of the developing world, we probably haven't. Uh, I think we need to start increasingly seeing China rather as an equal partner rather than um, a recipient of our mineral resources and us purchasing low value added goods from, from that economy. Thank you very much for being here today. Absolute pleasure. Thanks.